The topic of this essay, or the topics, I guess, is CVP analysis and product life cycle. And these topics make it a part two, section C question. The company is Buckeye Grain, and as always, we'll start at the beginning with the information. Buckeye Grain, a corn and wheat processing company, has decided to introduce a new product that can be manufactured by either a capital intensive method or a labor intensive method. The method chosen will have no effect on the quality of the finished product. Estimated costs for the two methods are as follows. So for capital intensive and labor intensive, we have the direct raw materials per unit, $10 for capital, $11.20 for labor intensive, the direct labor, $12 for the capital intensive, and $14.40 for the labor intensive. Variable overhead, $12 per hour. So the variable overhead per unit is six for capital intensive, $9.60 for labor intensive. The total fixed costs, 4,880,000 for the capital intensive and 2,640,000 for the labor intensive. And the names are descriptive. There's many more, many more fixed costs for the capital intensive and the labor costs are a little bit higher, a little bit more labor in the labor intensive uh, method of production. So continuing, Buckeye Grain sells the new product at $60 per unit during its initial stage of product life cycle. The incremental selling expenses are estimated to be $1,000 annually plus $4 for each unit sold regardless of the manufacturing method. Fixed costs are all directly traceable incremental costs. Now, what we have here with these selling costs is we have a million dollars of selling costs that are going to be a fixed cost plus $4 for each unit sold. And so those selling costs, we're going to see we have both a a variable element to it and also a fixed element to it. So continuing when deciding which manufacturing method to use, the company's management team take into account the operating leverage. Okay, so that's part of our decision making process. That's all the information. We have six requirements that we have to go through. First, calculate the estimated break even point in annual unit sales of the new product if the company uses the capital intensive manufacturing method and labor-intensive manufacturing method, respectively. Show your calculation. So we have two calculations we're going to have to do there. We're going to have to do the break-even point for the capital-intensive and the break-even point for the labor-intensive methods. The second requirement, calculate the annual unit sales volume at which the company would be indifferent between the two manufacturing methods. Show your calculations. The third requirement, explain how the level of sales can affect the company's choice of manufacturing method. And that's kind of uh, putting a little bit of perspective onto the second requirement. Okay, the second requirement, we determine the sales volume in which it doesn't matter. And then the third requirement is going to ask us to use that information in the decision for which method the company should choose. The fourth requirement, identify the four stages of the product life cycle. It is very briefly there, identify is all it says. The fifth requirement, identify the pricing strategy that the company might use when the new product is in its second stage of the product life cycle. Explain your answer. And finally, explain operating leverage and its relationship with business risk. So two parts there, what is operating leverage? And then how does operating leverage connect to what's its relationship with business risk? But we'll go ahead and start with the first requirement again. Very simple here, calculate the break-even point for the capital intensive method and the labor intensive method. Now, when we're gonna calculate the break-even point, we need to know what the fixed costs are, and we need to know what the contribution margin for each of these methods is. What is the contribution margin per unit for each of these methods? And so, we'll just go back and look at all of this information that they gave us as part of the information. And so, here we have our, our fixed costs that we have. Um, from our capital and labor intensive. And then we have here also the variable costs of production. Okay, so we've got that information. We'll have to deal with all of that. But then remember, it also tells us that we're gonna sell it at $60 per unit under each method. And we also have $1,000 of our incremental selling costs and that $4 variable selling cost for each unit that is sold. And so we have two fixed costs for each of them, the total fixed production costs, as well as these fixed selling expenses. And then we also have here, it looks like four variable costs that we're gonna to have to take into account to come up with the contribution margin. So 
We've put this in very simply here. This is just all that information. We've got our selling price at $60 for each of them. And then we have our raw materials, the direct labor, the variable overhead, and last this variable selling. Remember, that's our $4. It was the same no matter which method was used. And so we calculate that the capital intensive has a much higher contribution margin, which makes sense. They had the capital intensive had much higher fixed costs and that labor intensive has more variable costs of direct labor. And because there's more direct labor, there's more variable overhead applied to those under that method. And so if we just kind of take a moment here and ask ourselves, does 28 and $20 and 80 cents seem reasonable? Well, it does from the standpoint that we would expect the capital intensive method to have a higher contribution margin per unit than the labor intensive method. So with this information, we can go ahead and make our break even point calculations for the capital intensive. We have their direct fixed costs, those manufacturing fixed costs, as well as that million dollars of selling fixed costs. So under the capital intensive method, 210,000 units is the break even point. And we do the same calculation, fixed cost being a little bit different because the labor intensive has less fixed costs in the production process. $20.80 contribution per unit. And so the labor intensive break even point is 175,000 units. So we've answered the question. They told us to show our calculations and we've shown the calculations. That was the calculation of the contribution margin uh, per unit, the contribution per unit that we were looking at. And then we take this and we put this into the break even calculation with the capital and the labor intensive method. So that is requirement number one. We then go on to requirement number two, calculate the annual unit sales volume at which the company would be indifferent between the two manufacturing methods. And we need to show our calculations for this. Well, when we're looking at the situation where we don't care which, me which method it's gonna be, we know that the revenue is gonna be the same under each method at, a, at the same level of sales because the sales price is the same under both methods. And so that's not going to be an issue. But what we're looking at here is we're trying to find the point where the total costs are equal to each other because that quantity at which the total costs are equal to each other, the revenue is gonna be equal to each other. And so the profit is going to be the same. And so all we're setting up here is what are the total costs of the capital intensive method and what are the total costs of the labor intensive method? Okay, we've got that. Oh, actually, we're calculating the, the profit here. I, I'm sorry, we're calculating the profit out of all of this, but it's the same point where the total costs are equal to each other. And so we have that revenue minus the variable cost. We add to that the, oh wait, I'm sorry, we are calculating total cost because, I'll get it here myself, look at it a couple of times. The 60 minus 28, that is the variable costs that they have because 28 was the contribution. And so $32 a variable cost for the capital method. And then it looks like $39 and 20 cents of capital costs for the labor intensive method. So we are calculating the total cost here. Sorry about that. And then we just go through and do the math. Okay. And this is kind of skipping some steps here to the algebra from it. But what we calculate is at a quantity of 311,111 units, whether they choose the capital intensive method or the labor intensive method doesn't matter, okay? And so we're setting here, these are the variable costs and these are the fixed costs. These are the variable costs. These are the fixed costs under both methods. And we're just finding the level at which that level of that quantity at which those fixed costs are gonna be, or total costs are gonna be the same. And it's going to give us the same profit as well. That's all that the second requirement is, is to calculate this point of 311,111 units. As I said earlier, the third requirement kind of takes this and puts a little meat to it, a little perspective to it. Explain how the level of sales can affect the company's choice of manufacturing method. Well, 311,111 is the point where it doesn't matter. But if sales are expected to be greater than 311,111 units, the capital intensive method should be chosen as each unit has a greater contribution margin and fixed costs have been covered. 
If sales are expected to be less than 311,111 units, Buckeye Grain should select the labor-intensive method as there's less business risk. They're going to lose less money as well under 311,111. Oh, well, they may, they may not lose money. They will have a lower profit under that point. And so what that break-even point in terms of which method we prefer, which method is most beneficial to us, once we've calculated that point where it doesn't matter, above that level, we're going to choose the method that has the highest fixed costs. Below that level, we're going to choose the method that has the lowest fixed costs. And so the second step here then is for Buckeye Grain to estimate what their expected sales are going to be. And then, based on what they estimate those expected sales to be, they'll be able to make the decision as to which method they should be using to produce this product. So, that's the third requirement, giving a little bit of perspective there, depth to that calculation that we just made in the previous requirement. So, moving along to requirement number four, identify the four stages of the product life cycle. Well, this is fairly straightforward. The time span between the initial concept of a product or service and the time when the entity no longer produces the product, that's the product life cycle, the stages are introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. Now, if I was answering this question, their answer didn't put it this way, I would put the four stages. Okay, I would number them, one, two, three, four. The question was, identify the four stages, and so you want to make certain that you've clearly demonstrated that you know what those four stages are. But all we have to do is list them there. Identify the four stages. So then in requirement number five, identify the pricing strategy that the company might use when the new product is in its second stage of the product life cycle. Explain your answer. Well, here we've got a little bit of a connection to the previous requirement that if we don't know what the second stage is, it's less chance that we're going to actually come up with the right pricing strategy for that second stage, but we're prepared. We got those four stages, so we know that what we're talking about here is the growth stage. So we'll lead off our answer with that. When selling a product in its growth stage, competitors might release the same product at a lower price, or they might work on making the product better. The company might need to work on getting more customers. This could require more marketing and lowering the prices. The company might adopt a competitive pricing strategy. Okay? We're in the growth stage, which means we're making money. And if we're making money, other people are going to see that and are going to try to enter this market. They're going to have to be cheaper than we are. They're going to have to be better than we are. And so we've got more competition, so we may have a competitive pricing schedule or pricing strategy, and we may be lowering the prices. Again, this isn't the only way to communicate this, but in our answer, we need to say, this is the second stage, we're in the growth stage. Because we're in the growth stage, competitors are going to be coming into the market. And so our pricing is going to have to take into account the fact that we now have this competition and our customers have more choice than they had before. And finally, the last requirement, explain operating leverage and its relationship with business risk. Now, this is one where you absolutely want to make certain that you define operating leverage and say what operating leverage is. And then there's different ways you can go about connecting that to business risk the way they did it. Operating leverage is the extent to which a firm's operations employ fixed operating expenses. The greater the proportion of fixed expenses used to produce a product, the greater the degree of operating leverage. Okay, so that's a nice introduction about what we're talking about. So there it's, then it says, thus Buckeye Grain's capital intensive method utilizes a greater degree of operating leverage, okay? making it relevant to our situation here. The greater degree of operating leverage, the greater the change in operating income relative to a small fluctuation in sales volume. The greater the operating leverage and the resultant variability in operating income, the greater the degree of business risk. Okay, what we're looking at here is the situation that if we have a lot of operating leverage, like the capital intensive method, we have a lot of fixed costs. Which means we need to make certain we sell enough to cover those fixed costs. Because even if we sell nothing, we still have those fixed costs. And so until we cover those fixed costs, we're at risk. We're at risk that our sales are not going to allow us to cover our fixed costs. And obviously that's going to be 
a problem for the business. If we have a method where we have very little fixed costs, well, then we don't have to sell very much. We may not make very much whenever we sell an individual unit because we probably have higher variable costs, but we're not at risk of losing money right at the very beginning. Again, different ways to say that, okay, but we're trying to communicate here that when we have a higher operating, when we have a higher operating leverage, we have greater risk because those increased fixed costs, okay, those increased fixed costs, just like having a fixed cost of financing, there's greater risk than having a variable cost of financing, just applying it here to production instead of financing. So Buckeye Grains, we don't know what they're going to make, what decision they're going to make. We didn't get information about how many units they think they can sell, but we have the tool for that. If it's more than 311, you do the capital intensive. If it's less than 311,000, you do the labor intensive. We set that structure up so they're able to make that decision as soon as they have that sales forecast available to them. So nice question here about break-even analysis, having to calculate that. The two different methods allow us to make two calculations within one question, and then a couple of questions about how it is that we're able to use that. Again, make certain you answer the question that they ask when they ask to identify the four stages of the product life cycle. Identify the four stages. Doesn't say identify, describe, and give an example. Just identify. So you list one, two, three, four, you answer the question, you get your full points. And just a matter of going systematically through it, using the information that they give us in the question to answer the question. And again, not a lot here that was really challenging, I think, but it's a matter of sorting through the information, recognizing what it is that they're asking you specifically, and then making certain that your answer answers that question specifically.